morning, good morning, good morning. How are you this lovely morning? I hope you're doing well, I'm doing well. Let's slow down for the 30 mile an hour zone. Good tip if you're driving in a 30 mile an hour zone and you've got a manual car, is to put it in third gear. And then it sounds as though it's really going quite fast, whereas in fact it's not, it's only going 30. No, you all have to stop, you all have to stop. You all have to stop that eggs point. We've got to look at the six, seven cars piled up behind that van that's always parked there. It's amazing how few uh, houses have got facilities for off road parking. I suppose it all dates back to when nobody really uh, had a horse and they just used to walk to Wingham or wherever they were going, Grove, from Preston. Who needed space out the front for a horse and buggy? So we're going through quite an interesting economic times at the moment. We're in a case of, uh, we've got a, well I don't know, you could describe it as a stagflation combined with crack up boom, as Mises defined it. We've just been through this stupid situation where a few months ago there was like a run on the shops and uh, because of the Brexit panic. Uh, these things are a regular occurrence. I mean, like the COVID panic is very similar to the HIV panic of the 1980s. And the current run on the shops and the shortage of toilet rolls is very similar to the 2000 um, uh, millennium bug panic when everyone thought that all the computers in the world were going to fail because they'd only been programmed with two digits for the year instead of four and we were about to roll over from 1999 to 2000 and you have to sort of uh, just make yourself a bit more resilient like for example um, the garages have been closed in effect for two weeks and yet I'm still driving to work and I've still got half a tank because um, I've got a small tractor which I use to keep the grass short and, um, and it just so happened that I had uh, 40 litres of, I had a full tank of diesel in the car and 40 litres of diesel uh, uh, in two jerry cans for the tractor so and this car doesn't even use one tank of diesel. Um, a week to get to work and back and so um, I've been driving around because I'm resilient um, and uh, we've got two cars and one petrol's one diesel so you know even if diesel's available and petrol isn't or vice versa we're resilient because we've got two cars we're resilient it means that we can use the car that's got the fuel and, and afford not and don't have to use the car that hasn't got the fuel We've got the central heating at the moment's broken, the boiler's not working, but we've got an immersion heater uh, plus a spare element, so we're resilient in terms of hot water. And if the uh, you know we, we don't get the boiler working, the heater working, then and the radiators stay off, then we've got two wood burners in the house um, because we're resilient, so we can heat the house easily. Uh, with wood so have we got enough wood yes we've got I personally planted a hundred uh, uh, ash trees so in fact if you've got a few acres and you start planting trees you very quickly find that your problem is you've got too much wood <laughs> it's not, not not enough so yeah we've got uh, fuel uh, food is another matter, you know, I mean we've got things like uh, walnut trees and apple trees and a pear tree and stuff like that, but food is the weak point, isn't it, especially in the town, in the cities. But in the country, you know, you tend to have a neighbour who's a farmer, <laughs> you know, and you get on with your neighbours and 
and if push comes to shove, you would be able to pop round there and buy buy some cauliflowers off them or something or some potatoes. Um, are, are pretty much, you know, they probably even give them to you a lot of the time, and. Uh, and so in the country, obviously, we're far more resilient with food. So, petrol prices have, um, have shot up, but they, they didn't shoot up when they had no petrol. They shot up after they got the petrol in, which is odd because, uh, you know, they, the uh, press was searching for a story about petrol stations profiteering Whereas um, price fluctuations are entirely normal, dependent upon supply, and when in times when there's very low supply, then then prices should go up because it deters demand and it incentivizes suppliers. Um, but what happens is the government does the opposite. They, you know, the public starts to demand price controls and wages controls and things like that, which never work. So, you know, there's this horrible, um, the reason why empires take hundreds of years to fall is because there's this horrible mishmash going on at the moment, where in America they've sort of spent more money than us and, and given far more money away, um, although I think they've quite cleverly done it in the form of one-off checks, stimulus checks, which they call stimmies. Um, and they've given away about $3,000 to every single adult in the United States in the form of stimulus checks. And, and they don't intend to give away any more, I don't think. Um, the rest of it's being done through several multi-trillion dollar federal spending packages. So they are, they are um, you know, spending money like a drunken sailor. And over there, the argument has gone well past the uh, uh, how do we pay this back phase, uh, you know, by tightening our belts and, and shrinking government and spending less. That's, that's a no-go. Uh, Nobody's suggested that even anymore in America. And then the next thing, which is, um, uh, we'll uh, outgrow the debt, we'll get the economy, will expand so fast that... Uh, the debt as a proportion of the uh, gross domestic product size of the economy will will shrink and so we'll get things back under control that way that's again it's uh, uh, mathematically not possible for any economy to grow at the speed that they're printing money so they've not even nobody in their sensible mind in America is even discussing that um, and so um, they're left with the other uh, third way, whether there are another two ways of doing it. They can either inflate the money supply, in other words, uh, reduce the purchasing power of the money, make it worth this in terms of how much it buys, in, and, 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 and as a result, make the debt, reduce the debt, you know, so that instead of owing a lot of money, you owe, you owe a ham sandwich, or um, default which is basically just stop paying pensions and stop paying the armed forces, which is also like unthinkable. So, so you're left with deflation or inflation, really, uh, debasement of the currency. And uh, in America, they pretty well, uh, you know, accepted that that's how they're going to do it. Um, what happens is Milton Friedman taught us that uh, if you inflate the money supply, then what happens is because you have more money chasing the same amount or less of goods and services then the amount of money that you need to pay for goods and services goes up and we've seen that in the UK already it was first apparent in house prices and it's become um, you know also in conjunction with uh, none of one of the Chancellor's harebrained schemes to give money away to the uh, construction industry by abolishing stamp duty on new builds um, or, or houses, you know, sell 
for the sort of price that new builds sell for, uh, in the same way as he gave away money to the um, entertainment industry by subsidising everybody to eat out for £10 per person or something. Um, and uh, so we've, we've got it's now now the, the ratio between the average income the average uh, used to be the average income of the wage earner the main wage earner in the family and then it became the average income of, of the whole family you know because the wife had to go out to work as well so the ratio between the average house price and the average family income now is, well, is right out of whack and wages need to catch up um, and, uh, which means that we're going to be in for a lot of um, industrial unrest as people realise that uh, you know, the fact that petrol shot up from 129 a, a litre to 145 a litre is going to have a major impact on their um, that, not, not only petrol I mean everything you know uh, consumer price inflation is uh, going to start to manifest itself in absolutely everything because once the cost of uh, fuel goes up, then the cost of everything goes up because everything's moved around by lorry. So uh, uh, it, it, it all, it's all subtly priced in, you know. And uh, uh, our friend uh, Vladimir in Russia wants to put a gas pipeline called Nord Stream 2 across Europe so that he can pump gas directly to Germany and the Americans are putting pressure on all the Europeans to uh, refuse um, uh, permission and uh, little uh, Greta Thunberg and everyone is saying that no we've, we've got to cut out carbon from everything so as a result a liquid natural gas price has shot up something like 400% in the UK uh, which we get 50% we produce ourselves 30% we buy from the Norwegians uh, pretty much I should imagine the spot will rate or they might be, we might have a bit of a deal with them uh, and 20% we buy on the world market which is, is, is all of a sudden nobody's selling so uh, they've had to abolish the price cap on domestic consumer prices not abolish it but put it up by, by a few hundred quid so everyone's going to be paying a few hundred quid more for their heating um, but more importantly uh, gas intensive industries like uh, fertiliser plants and that are having to shut down or work part time and this is not just in the UK I mean this is across the world uh, China's got a series of rolling blackouts uh, India's down to one day's reserve of coal because they're mainly coal-fired uh, power generation over there. Um, and so, what does people, uh, you know, people are saying that you know, the government needs to do something? So, uh, <laughs> I'd just like to say, it's the government that's done this. <laughs> the problem is the government. The problem is, the government is writing IOUs and then, which are then being bought by the central bank, which then allows the government to uh, create money. The central bank then sends the government money, which they then use to uh, buy their, I, their, their IOUs. So, because uh, it's a complicated, I won't explain it all, but I mean, the way it works is that when governments want to raise money, they issue bonds. The bonds are at a fixed interest rate, and therefore, if um, they represent a sort of a risk free baseline for, for uh, lending, because you, you know you're always going to get your money back, because the government can always print as much money as it needs to. Give you, give you the government money back. So you never lose money on a government bond. That's why they're called gilts. <coughs> because they're bonds that have like gold, a gold edge because they, they never default. But it does mean that, um, let's say that they're paid 
let's say they're paying, uh, I don't know, 1% or something, and uh, you can buy them cheap, then that represents uh, a greater interest rate on the same gilt if, if it was expensive. So with gilts, you don't look at the interest rate so much, you look at the price of the gilt. If you can buy a 1% gilt cheaply, then you're doing better than if you can buy, have to buy a 1% gilt expensively. And so it's in the government's interest to um, keep the price of gilts up. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by buying them. You know, and even if no one else will buy them. What you do is you issue guilt and you issue guilts and use the money you raise to buy buy more guilts. <laughs> and if it sounds like a Ponzi scheme, it is. <laughs> so, so that's how the government's uh, manipulating the interest rate, and that affects their um, that affects their uh, plan to uh, get themselves out of all this debt. Uh, basically, by uh, allowing uh, consumer prices to inflate the money supply, that then finds its way through into consumer price inflation. It deflates the cost of their repaying their debt, and at the same time, by using debt to buy gilts, they keep their borrowing costs low, their interest costs low, so that their, their cost of servicing the debt is low all the time it's being devalued. And that, in a nutshell, is is the whole Ponzi. You know, that is the whole. Uh, that is the whole scam, right? That's been carried on in this country for centuries. Well, at least, well, no, not centuries actually, since we came off the gold standard in, in about 1931 or uh, the uh, dollar standard in 1971. So, but having said that, the Americans have, you know, they know, they know, they go, they know what the gag is. <laughs> And they've been criticised for doing what they're doing, but at least everybody knows what they're doing, and they like they they won't admit that is what they're doing. But I mean, all the evidence consistently points to it. But you'll, you'll never get Jerome Powell, Federal the Reserve, say, "Yeah, we're we're operating a Ponzi scheme," but you know, they the, the whole thing collapses when nobody wants dollars anymore. But that's a different story. But in the UK, what we're doing is we're still going with the the other narratives. The narratives that they've lost, they've dropped in America. Uh, the narratives being that we need to raise uh, interest rates to keep a lid on inflation, um, and that the uh, economy will grow, outgrow the debt, and. The, the raising interest of course is not at all popular with the people, everyone's got a mortgage so nobody wants to see interest rates go up um, but I suppose because proportionately we, we borrowed a bit the government borrowing is a bit less than um, the Americans as a percentage of GDP, although it's still over 100 I think it's over 100, it's 105% of GDP um, it's slightly less of a it's slightly less of a suicidal risk to put interest rates up and also because I know cost of borrowing is very low and unlike the Americans who roll over their debt every like two five or ten years our most of our debt is like on uh, 10 50 or 100 year agreement so uh, we don't have to worry about uh, our cost of borrowing quite so much the, the narrative that the economy is going to outgrow the debt is a very nice one for media. If a government spokesman goes on uh, uh, Sky or something, then the message that um, all we've got to do is wait. And uh, you know, and we've, we've okay, yeah. So we've blown a few thousand quid on the credit card. Yeah, but what we're going to do now? We're going to we're just going to rein it in a bit, put taxes up a bit. Uh, and uh, you know, slow down government spending a bit, and uh, you know, go down the Winchester and have a pint, and er and everything will blow over, you know, and we'll we'll come out the other side. 
Uh, and I'm not at all sure that that's true. I don't think we will come out the other side of this at all. Uh, but it's very good for TV. It's like I say, people want they're, they're immensely reassured by the idea that uh, it's all going to, everything's going to be, uh, you know, all of a sudden it, it all went wonky temporarily, but, you know, pretty soon it'll be business as normal, you know. And in the meantime, the cost, you know, the, the price of their house has shot up. And they're delirious about that, you know, their house that they bought for 180000 or whatever is now worth 250000 And that's all they can think about, you know. They don't, uh, they don't understand that that's, uh, that house price increase is a symptom. Of the, and the, the, the pension, you know, that what, what they had saved up in their pension let's say 180,000, same price as their house, what that pension will buy now, they're gonna need 250,000 pounds to buy because the, it's the money that's being debased. The house hasn't suddenly leapt up in, in value. The house is, still, is worth exactly the same. It's just that you need more pounds now to buy it. But people don't know that. It's shh, secret, secret, okay. Just between you and me, okay, all right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.